Hi everybody. <laughs> Hi everybody. Um, kind of first day back at the office. I think you would have seen though, over the past couple of uh, days, what was it last week I'd spent, I, I kept coming to the office actually just because I needed to prepare, um, prepare the office for the rest of the team, right? Um, I wanted to come into your space today because I wanted us to talk a little bit about what's been happening all over the world. And no doubt, if you've been reading, you know, newspapers, you're following the media, you've seen what's been happening in the US. Um, the, the killing of George Floyd by the police officer, or now former police officer in Minneapolis. And, um, you know, it really isn't, a, it's not, it's not unique anymore. I feel like it's happened so many times, you know, there's those Trayvon Martin, I mean, I've got a whole, I posted a couple of pictures, Trayvon Martin, there's, there's just been so many, so many, and it's happened so many um, times, just so many times now that I, I, I can't see, I really can't see how anybody's going to argue that this is not targeted or that it's not race-based. Um, but that's not the point that I wanted to make here today. I think that the evidence is clear, you stack it up. Um, there's a, a beautiful line by Black Ice, the poet, he said, he says, the evidence is clear, we can stack it up. Kanye made the statement, Ice here to back it up. It's true. We live in a beautiful world, but ugly souls push the buttons. Don't you love that statement? We live in a beautiful world, but ugly souls push the buttons. It's like, wow, right? And I kind of think that that's really where we are. Like, I think, I think we're living in that kind of time right now, right? Um... Then there were, yeah, you know, there were, I, so, you know, I've, I've probably received about 20 DMs of people saying, hey, Vusi, what do you think? And I was just like, you know, I'll, I'll do a live because I feel like you can't post a comment, even a thread, because of, of the, the difficulty and the emotional uh, level of emotion attached to the issue. So first, let me say this. Let me say this. The way injustice thrives is injustice needs the acquiescence of the just. So the way injustice works, the way oppression works, is it works when people who are just keep quiet. When people who are just don't challenge it. When people who are just go, hey, let me sit on the sidelines because this has got nothing to do with me. That's the way injustice works. So if you're sitting on the sidelines then saying this is some nothing to do with you, you're a part of how of what enables the injustice. Literally a part of what enables the injustice. And that's across races. And then the second thing is I noticed on my timeline, probably over the past two to three days on Twitter, um, people just being like, you know, why are we so concerned about what's happening in the US? Like we've got our own issues to deal with in South Africa. And I can't tell you just how dangerous that mindset is. Like that mindset is deeply problematic and very dangerous. And I'm going to tell you why. It's problematic and dangerous because, again, the way injustice works is it requires the acquiescence of the just. So if something is happening in the US or in Australia or in, I don't know, Tasmania that affects people of color and you're quiet about it because you're in South Africa and you're going, well, it doesn't affect me. Guess what? Then when something happens here that doesn't affect them, they're going to keep quiet too. And, and I want you to remember that when we were going through our deepest, darkest time in apartheid, a lot of people of color and some who are white stood with black South Africans and their suffering by boycotting and, and, and putting up protests in the U.S. So we really can't afford to sit on the sidelines and go, well, it doesn't affect me, so I'm not going to get involved here. It's, it's shocking. You should be able to, you should get involved. But let me tell you one final thing about why I think that mindset is dangerous. And for me, I'm just stunned at how nobody understands the universality of this problem. There is a universality to the black condition, right? It doesn't matter where in the world you go, but... If you're going to find people of color anywhere in the world, you're going to find that they're financially excluded. You're going to find that they're, that they're economically segregated. And you're going to find that they're socially and physically separated from opportunities. That's how oppression has organized itself, particularly around how it's organized us. So it doesn't matter where you go, whether you're in Louisiana or you're in 
Mississippi, or you're in Alex, right? Uh, or you're in Makoko in Nigeria. It doesn't matter where you go. Even in places where we are in the majority, you will see that, that if, even in places where we are in the majority, economic oppression, economic exclusion, uh, uh, social and, and, and physical uh, separation from opportunities is a part of the black condition. So you can't be sitting in South Africa in township somewhere going, you know, I don't want to get involved in this issue about what's happening with George Floyd because men are in Tindao. It actually does tinta you in Tindao. It tinters you at the fact that you're black and that what the world has done, this is a universal global thing. What the world has done is it has normalized black suffering, normalized it. If I say to you, poverty, tell me the first image you see. Let me guess. It's a, it's a child. They're black. And they are against the backdrop of some rural area in Africa. Where did that image come from? You think that image just happened by mistake? You don't think that there's a, this is what we talk about when we talk about institutionalized racism and structural exclusion. You don't think that there is a institutionalized racism and a structure of exclusion that makes, that continues to perpetuate and make sure that economic opportunities don't go to people of color. You don't think that. Like you think it's just, it just happened, Jay, just Jay, that the image of poverty is black. I said this once at a keynote and I will never forget. I was delivering this keynote literally in the UK. And I said this, I said, the truth about black poverty is black poverty is necessary for white guilt. Ooh, that's such a painful statement. I'm sure somebody's going to be watching this. They're going to catch feelings. Remember, and by the way, if you're catching feelings, remember that offense is not given, it's taken. So before you get offended, maybe ask yourself about what it is that I've just said that offends you. But black guilt, black poverty requires, is, is, the, is literally the twin sister of white guilt. So what Euro Europeans do or white people who've done well, even in Africa do, is they go and find black poverty to cleanse themselves of the guilt they feel for white privilege. You, you, you can't deal with the guilt of white privilege unless you, 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 you have black poverty. Those two things literally require each other. They're like twin sisters. Easy, go and check any listed company, go and see their CSI documents, see the communities they work in, see the black faces that they show. Like, the, you know, it's, it's always that our faces are the faces of lack, of depravity, of, of um, lack of opportunities, lack of education. Our faces, our, our, our skin is always the embodiment of all the things that are not going well in the world. We're always embedded right in that narrative, right in that narrative. There's a, I mean, I had an argument the other day with a friend of mine who runs an impact investment fund in Kuala Lumpur. And I went to the site and I was like, so I saw his website and I was like, dude, why have you got black people on your website? And the way he had it was he was talking about, you know, the need for impact investing and the sustainable development goals and poverty around the world. And then he's got these black images showing black poverty. And I was like, you're running, you're, you're in Kuala Lumpur. There's, which black, per, black people are you investing in in Kuala Lumpur? Like, what, what am I missing here? But it's because the way the narrative works is you make blackness a synonym for poverty, blackness a synonym for depravity, blackness a synonym for lack of education, blackness a synonym for all of these things. And then you overlay that with like white charity so you can cleanse white guilt. That's the way the system works. So if you're watching this and you're wondering why you should be concerned about Black Lives Matter in the U.S., is precisely because the black condition is universal. Whether you're talking about black Africans in South Africa, or you're talking about the Aboriginal people in, in, in Australia, or you're talking about the Native Americans in the US, or you're talking about the you know, uh, former slaves Caribbean, uh, in the Caribbeans, the black condition is universal. Everywhere in the world, we are, as a people, we are consistently deprived of opportunities. We're consistently excluded from the system of, economic, of economics. We're consistently left out of the financial systems, consistently. It's a consistent, well-architectured thing. It's not happening by mistake. It's happening because it's deliberate. And I think the worst of these, the absolute worst of these are black professionals like myself, black business people like myself, and black executives in large companies 
who sit in those institutions of power and adopt the mindset of the institution, forgetting the reality that they come from. That for me is the worst betrayal. It's even, wor it's even, worse, than the, it's even worse than the white guy who kneeled on George Floyd and killed him. It's the black people who get included in the system. You're now a director at the multinational. You're running transformation or you're running finance or you're running marketing. And you're just worried about your performance quota, making sure that you achieve your numbers so that you can get, get your, your two or three X multiple of bonus so that you can get your equity share earning. That's what you're worried about. You have no concern over your brothers and your sisters and, and the nature of structural exclusion. So, can we stop comparing suffering? Especially those of us who've gone justice for Collins Cause. Yes, justice for Collins Cause. Fuck it, yeah. Justice for Collins Cause. Justice for Andres Tatani. Justice for the Marikana. Justice for every single black body that is victimized. Every single black body that is is made a victim of justice for all of it and it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is whether the perpetrator is a democratically elected legitimate government or the perpetrator is a a illegitimate government like the apartheid government it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is we need to call out injustice no matter where the injustice finds itself and so the reason a lot of us revolutionaries are quiet now and we're quiet about what happened in marikana is because of who was in power when marikana happened Let's call it what it is. It's a universal thing. So don't dare sit there and think that when are you okay? I'm going to say this one last thing and then I'm going to leave you. Do you know how this is how <laughs> this is how we as as a people, particularly as black people, this is how we have been consistently marginalized by the rest of the world. We're, we're, we're taught to believe that the suffering of one is not the suffering of all. So there's some of you watching this, you're already back at the office, so you're working from home. You're getting paid a full salary by the company you work in. So in your mind, you're not worried about the people who are living in deep slow, who haven't earned a salary for the past two months, no work, no pay. Because when I was home, I get when I was home, you went to varsity, you got your education, you got your degree, you're now working in a corporate somewhere, junior, you know, you're either a senior employee or some sort of junior management employee, you're okay. So you're not worried about the suffering of others. This is what irritates me with us is we never worry about the suffering of others until we are the ones that suffer. Now, when you're suffering, you want the whole world to jump up and down and go, yo, this is wrong. I'll never forget many years ago, I had a tiff with the guys at the NYDA. It was a fairly public tiff. You can see the videos on, on, on YouTube because I felt then and, and still do now to some extent that the NYDA was completely absent in the lives of young black people completely absent in the, in the lives of young black people. They still are today. I mean, I'm happy to debate anybody from the NYDA that says this. But Cyril Ramaphosa would not have needed to create a youth employment service if the NYDA was doing its job. There would have, known, there would have been no need for Tashmil to do the work that she's doing with YES if the NYDA was doing its job. There would have been no need. But I remember I had an issue with uh, the NYDA at the time and the former CEO has actually become like a, a, you know, a mate since. Because again, for me, these issues are not personal. You have to attack the issue and the principle, not the person. And then I, there were people who came after me on social media. As these things happen, by the way, because there are people who are benefiting from that system. So they'll attack you, right? And I'll never forget, there was a director at the NYDA <laughs> who immediately after our Stop NYDA campaign stopped and finished, she was then suspended. And she called me up and she said, Vusi, would you please bring back the Stop NYDA campaign? I was like, why? And she said, well, because they've just suspended me and it's so unfair. And I was like, hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So when we were fighting for the NYDA doing work for young black people and you were a director getting paid 1.5 million rand a year, you had no problems with it at the time. But now because the NYDA has turned against you and you've been suspended, you want the fight to continue? This is how injustice works. And I'm warning every single person watching this, do not let this injustice go un unspoken about. Don't let, don't let, this thing about George Floyd is much bigger than George Floyd. Do you know why a black man can be killed while the person is being filmed with a knee on on, with a knee on his neck for nine minutes after they've had eight years of a black person in power 
in the presidency. Do you know why? Because a black man's life is cheap. That's why. Black people's lives are cheap. Let's call it what it is. Because let me tell you for free. If those miners that were killed in Marikana were not black. Let me tell you for free that if the miners that were killed in Marikana were white women above the age of 50, we would have long since, long since, seen all sorts of actions taken by the state and the police. So why do you think the uh, soldiers can jump into a black man's home and kill him in his home? Because a black man's life is cheap. Now you're watching this and you're going, Hey, Vosungas again. I'm a black man. I've got two boys who are black men. A young little girl who's a black female. And sooner or later, she's going to grow up into the world that's going to see her exactly the way it sees all the others. And a lot of us, a lot of us are full of it because we think just because we went to the right schools and you speak the Queen's English, you think all of a sudden that disqualifies you from your blackness. You think you're a different kind of black. You're a better black. That's what you think. And that's why when there's suffering happening, you're quiet. You don't want to say shit. Because no, it doesn't involve you. We're not getting, you went to school. You're here, where I am. You're in Santon. Hmm? Nice car. Nice life. Nice house. Nice suburb. Nice schools. Nice English. Your whole life is nice. This is precisely the problem with us. Is that we don't see that our agenda is a single agenda. Question for you is this. What are you going to do now? See the comments coming in. You know, facts. Sure. Facts. We built every, I mean, we built the United States. Slaves built the U.S. Slaves built the U.S. I don't know if you understand this, but the average African-American in the U.S. has been in the United States longer than Donald Trump's family has been in the United States. <laughs> So black people built the U.S. We built it. 200 and something years of, of, of our labor that was volunteered and we were not paid for it to this day. We built it. South Africa, who do you think built South Africa? Who do you think was working in the gold mines? <laughs> who do you think went underground and lost their lives? Who do you think built all these large multinationals you see? We built that shit. We built it. And we built it in, we paid the highest price because it wasn't just that we were underpaid or paid slave wages. It was that people died. And the problem with a lot of us is because we don't know our history. You don't even know that in your family was a family member who came to Gauteng and died. Never to be seen, from, never to be seen or heard from again. Died underground somewhere. Was never buried. Their spirit has never ever found peace. But because you don't know. You're a better kind of black. You're a different black. Black people, we really need to wake up. And I'm not interested in, 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 making, in, in identifying who the enemy is. Like it, for me, it's not about the others. It's about us. It's not about us fixing other races. It's about us getting our act together for crying out loud. For God's sakes, man. We are our own worst enemies. Black person does well. Black person pulled them down. Black person gets a deal, black person pulls them down. Black person gets opportunities, black person tries to pull them down. That's what we do. Because we've been fed this mindset of black poverty and black depression for so long that when one amongst us doesn't live that reality, we want to pull them back down. Literally, we are PhDs. So you turn on your TV. You see a man saying, I can't breathe in a country most of you probably have never been to. And you think, I said it, Tabatzak. These Americans must get their act together. It is the Tabatzahal. That's a black man. Let me ask you a final question. You think if George Floyd was a young Jewish person, a young Jewish man, and that, pol that policeman did that to him, you think Israel wouldn't have said something about that shit? Fuck out of here. Don't joke. 
You think if George Floyd, God forbid, was a young Afrikaner man, you think Afri Forum would be quiet? But you're quiet. Because you, yourself, have bought into the narrative of black suffering. And when you see it, it doesn't even move you emotionally. You feel nothing when you see your brothers and sisters in other parts of the world suffering. Because the synonym for black is suffering. The synonym for poverty is black. You must wake up. It's going to be dumb. Okay? It's going to be dumb. Think. Don't be out here on some it doesn't affect me. I'm only worried about Collins, Collins Cosa. Worry about Collins Cosa and Andres and every other black life that is cheapened all over the world. Because let me tell you, the system doesn't look at you and go, oh, you're black, but you're a better black. Oh, no, you're black from the U.S. No, the system goes, chief, you're black. Finished pelile, underline, full stop. You know, there's been a whole movement about return to return home, driven in particular by Ghana. A lot of African Americans, particularly affluent ones, traveling back home. We are one, guys. We are one. And and injustice anywhere is a threat to peace everywhere. And injustice thrives when it has acquiescence, when you and I are quiet, when we say nothing. That's when injustice thrives. And it's funny how it's not a problem until it affects you. Get it's funny. It's not a problem. Unemployment is not a problem until you lose your job. Lack of access to credit, not a problem until you are working for 10 years and you still can't buy a house. Then it's a problem. We need to stop this thing of thinking about the problem affecting me only. Because the whole system identifies us as an entire group. That's it, man. I'm done. Comment below. Tell me what you think. I'd, be, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. I'd love to get your thoughts on what you think. Cheers.